This channel is part of the History Hits Network. I'm heading out across Britain to find the history embedded in the landscape. This is a country where you're never very far from an ancient routeway, a glimpse of lost industry, or a grand monument from our past. So from coastal paths to hilltop tracks, I've started doing some serious walking. Each of my walks leads me to a different time and a stunning location to find the stories you can only really appreciate on foot. This week I'm in Wiltshire, one of the richest places for unearthing our past and home to the greatest concentration of prehistoric monuments in Europe. I want to know how these sites are connected and what they can tell me about life and death in Britain around four and a half thousand years ago. I'm going to be walking through the last centuries of the Stone Age. This hike through history takes me across some of the most beautiful landscape in the southwest. But it's what our ancestors were doing here between 4000 and 2000 BC that's kept us guessing for centuries. From my starting point at Windmill Hill, my 45 mile route heads south to the stone circles around Avebury, an area so rich with sights, it'll keep me busy for the whole day. Day two, and I'm on the hunt for hard evidence of Stone Age activity at Silbury Hill and the West Kennet Long Barrow. And after climbing Milk Hill, I'll be turning my attention to more modern mysteries. On the final day of my walk, I'll be following our ancestors down the River Avon to the greatest prehistoric monument of them all, Stonehenge. Halfway back in time, between now and the end of the Ice Age, Wiltshire stood out. While the rest of the country was covered in dense forest, this part of Britain was not unlike we see it today, open grasslands. And this period we call the New Stone Age, the Neo meaning new, Lithic meaning something to do with stones. The Neolithic period had arrived. This is Windmill Hill and it's where I'm starting my walk. And it's the perfect place to survey a massive change in our history, because around about 4000 BC, the Mesolithic people, the hunter-gatherers, started to settle down, put down roots, began farming. This is the birth of civilization in Britain. And the earliest sign of this seismic change happening is here, right beneath my feet. Windmill Hill is one of the earliest examples of people enclosing open space. It's hard to get much of a sense of the Neolithic landscape here, partly because of all this grass, but can you see there's a bank there? That bank goes all the way round, 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 round. A massive Neolithic enclosure, nine hectares of it. This was a gathering place, and that in itself represents a profound change in prehistoric Britain. Those first farmers needed somewhere to buy and sell their animals and crops and have a good old gossip. A kind of prehistoric village square, if you like. But Windmill Hill dates from early Neolithic Britain. What I'm really interested in is what was going on round here in the last centuries of the Stone Age. By then, early British farming communities had enough food to put their time and their minds to matters other than day-to-day -day survival. Just about a mile down from Windmill Hill and a thousand years later in history, and we find the biggest prehistoric stone circle in Europe, which is just around this corner. 
Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries from History Hit and uncover the secrets of some of the most famous people and events in history. History Hit gives you access to a growing range of documentaries presented by and featuring historians at the forefront of research and debate. Whether you are looking to find out more about charismatic leaders like Cleopatra or to discover the story behind the Industrial Revolution, History Hit will have something for you. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Absolute History fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. Avebury Henge. And it's enormous. 340 metres across, three quarters of a mile around. It's so big, the modern village now partially sits inside it. Here once stood 400 stones, forming one massive outer and two inner circles. And today, unlike at Stonehenge, you can actually walk among them. I'm meeting Josh Pollard, the most recent archaeologist to finish a dig here. What do we think they might have been for? Current thinking is that monuments created out of stone are very closely linked to concepts of ancestry. So basically when people die, they become ancestors, and ancestors are the agents that look after the living. So it's not surprising if all your well-being is tied into the world of the ancestors that you want to honour those ancestors and you want to house those ancestors. So perhaps Avebury is one of those locations where the ancestral dead were housed. And what might its relationship be with some of the other sites here? Well, there's a very close relationship in some cases with two of the entrances out of the Avebury Henge to the south and over to the west. You've got megalithic avenues, stone avenues, one going up to a series of timber and stone circles at the sanctuary. But of course, this whole landscape is filled with monuments. What it, it, it emphasises is just how important this landscape was, how sacred this landscape was. I've got to know these sites quite well over the years, but as I walk between them for the first time, I want to find out just how they're connected. And this afternoon, I'm following in the footsteps of one of archaeology's first pioneers, who 300 years ago thought he'd worked out the link. William Stukeley. Stukeley had the wide and varied interests of a real gentleman of the Enlightenment best mates with Isaac Newton and his first biographer. It's only because of Stukeley that we know the whole apple falling from the tree story. More importantly for me, though, Stukeley was an antiquarian, an early forerunner of an archaeologist. He didn't dig Avebury. No one really excavated sites back then but he was the first person to give visual as well as written descriptions of these archaeological sites. And they led him to some rather imaginative conclusions. He had a theory, Stukeley. His theory was that Avebury was part of this great mysterious shape of a serpent, and the serpent's head was here at what we now call the sanctuary, and that's where I'm going next. Stukeley concluded Avebury was what he called a Dracontia, or Dragon Temple. It seemed to him that stone circles always appeared near places with local legends of dragon slaying. And less than 30 miles from here is where St George is said to have killed the dragon. That's nonsense, of course, but Stukeley was partly right. The two sites are connected by a purpose-built avenue. I'm not going to follow the prehistoric route because that's now become the B4003. Nice to see that we're marking our landscape just like our prehistoric ancestors. But luckily, other walking routes are available, including a short section of the Ridgeway National Trail. 
and a mile and a half from Avebury is... Ta-da! Bit of an anticlimax, isn't it? This is the sanctuary, the head of Stukeley's serpent. Stukeley had this theory, which was that this place and Avebury and Stonehenge were all built by the same group of people, the oldest recorded religious sect in Britain, the Druids. You know the ones, ancient priest types, fans of the big beard. Hiya. Hello. Good to see you. Ronald Hutton is an expert in pre-Christian religion. Ronald, you know just about everything there is to know about Stukeley. Was he right? He made a breakthrough until his time there these big arguments about Stonehenge, Avebury and the rest, whether they were built by the Romans, by the Vikings, by the Arthurian period people. Stukeley was the guy who convinced us once and for all they were built by the prehistoric British, and he was right. Quite impressive, really, considering he didn't have much to go on back in the 1700s. One of the few guides he had to prehistoric Britain was Julius Caesar's account of his invasion and the Iron Age Celts he defeated. Caesar introduced Stukeley to the Druids, and that's when the confusion begins. There are two problems. The first is Druid is a Celtic word for a priest or magician. It's the language spoken in the Iron Age when actual Druids were around. So Stukeley put two and two together, religious monuments and Iron Age priests. But he'd got his dates wrong, as these monuments were actually built about a thousand years earlier than he thought. Stukeley was convinced, though, and the Druids made a big impression on him. They caught his imagination. He's a romantic. He wants to walk his talk. He actually is a Druid himself for a while. So what did he think they were like, then? He thought they were lovely. <laughs> Thanks to Stukeley, we think we know what they look like and what they were like. We don't. But Stukeley gave us the image of a druid as an old guy with a long beard, long hair, a staff and a hood. This isn't just the image of the druid we're stuck with, it's the image of the wizard. That's why Gandalf looks like that, not just druids. It is Ian McKellen, isn't it? It is. Despite his rather fanciful visions of the Druids, Stukeley had got something spot on. These are sacred sites, and there is a connection between them. And our fascination with these monuments shows no sign of waning, because hundreds of years later, we still struggle to know what they mean. So tomorrow, I'm going to head off towards those two hills, which you can just about see through the murk, because up there, there's a pair of archaeological sites where they've unearthed some tangible clues as to why they were built. And I promise you, it's got nothing to do with serpents or druids. My walk through Wiltshire is so littered with Neolithic monuments I haven't actually managed to get that far. Still, I've already seen how, since the birth of archaeology, these enigmatic sites have given rise to some really out there theories. I'm starting day two of my walk with the last two monuments that make up this massive Neolithic complex here at Avebury. Monuments that have been dug so much, they've practically been destroyed. I want to find out what the latest digs around here have uncovered. So after my circular route around Avebury and a night right next to its stones, I'll be taking a walk east through the upper valley of the River Kennet, starting at Silbury Hill. En route, I'll be cutting through the myths and legends that have built up around so many of these sites as I make my way to the West Kennet Long Barrow. First up, though, a spot of local folklore. Apparently, for some unknown reason, the devil wanted to bury the whole of Avebury. So he's got all this earth and he's carrying it, and over in Avebury, they hear about it, and some bright spark goes rushing around all the houses. He collects loads of shoes in a sack. He comes out here, he says to the devil, are you going to bury Avebury? The devil says, yeah. He said, but it's miles away. Look how many pairs of shoes I've worn out just to get there. And the devil says, well, stuff that, I'm not carrying it that far. And he dumps it, and it's still there today, and we call it Silbury Hill. 
But of course, it wasn't really made by the devil. It's actually man-made. This huge 30-metre hill was completed towards the end of the Stone Age. But why was it made? It's so unlike any other of the monuments round here. Over the centuries, a myth grew up that inside it, there was a golden statue of a man. Then that became the life-size golden statue of a man. Then that became the life-size golden statue of a man on a horse. Since the 1700s, numerous people have dug tunnels into the hill, looking for the treasure supposedly buried beneath. But all anyone has ever found is Earth. By the 21st century, this prehistoric enigma now resembled a giant Swiss cheese. And then disaster struck. The hill started to collapse. Archaeologist Jim Leary led the final dig here before the hill was stabilised. And he too found nothing but dirt. But with modern analysis, it's very interesting dirt. Prior to our excavations, it was understood that the mound was constructed in three uh, large episodes. This is what I was taught at university. It was constructed in three phases. But it wasn't. Now, that's extraordinary, because I've always thought that Silbury Hill would be built rather like they built the pyramids, which they created around about the same time. No, that does not appear to be the case. It appears to have evolved over time. I think that it was much more a case of people coming and they're bringing with them basket loads of material, which they're then piling one on top of the other for some reason, little and often. In a sense, this is a byproduct, what we're looking at here. The actual meaning was in the process of people bringing that stuff to it. Since the last major dig here 40 years ago, radiocarbon dating methods have become so sophisticated that Jim has discovered Silbury Hill was constructed bit by bit over about 150 years. And it's that process that can tell us so much about the people who built it. They might be bringing a little bit of their own home turf with them, um, thereby drawing their um, allegiance to this area. Why here, though? Why not somewhere else? I think that probably um, is to do with water. But there isn't any water here, is there? There isn't any more, but if you just come with me to the other side of the road, yeah. I'll show you. OK. Jim's leading me to Swallowhead Springs. Back in the Neolithic times, this spring would have been closer to Silbury Hill. And this water source is key to Jim's theory. This is the source of the River Kennet. Ah, this is actually the Kennet. Yeah. That's where the, the spring flows from at the moment. So, in 2500 BC, you had all these people, hundreds of people, with these little baskets of earth. What do you think was going on in their minds? It's impossible to say, because we just don't know what they were thinking in the Neolithic period, but it could be that this is marking the point of the sacred river. This river, Kennet, flows into the River Thames. The River Thames, we know, was an important river in the Neolithic period. They were, they were depositing axes and various things into it, um, in a sense, worshipping it. So it was a sacred river. And this right here is the source of that sacred river. And by worshipping the source of the river, they, in effect, build Silbury Hill. And, of course, it's not just the mystical, sacred elements of the river. It's, there's a practicality to it as well. These are new farmers. These are people who really need to control their water sources. And if it dries up like it has today, you've got serious problems. That's right. They've anchored themselves to a place and they need the water to keep flowing. It could be that that's what Silbury is about. I don't know if you felt the same as me, but I thought that notion that Silbury Hill was created by generation after generation after generation of ordinary people with their little bowls full of earth was really touching and really beautiful. So ceremonial monuments back in the New Stone Age weren't always about the dead. 
and they had a pragmatic element as well. At Silbury Hill, the life-giving qualities of water were being worshipped. But time for me to walk on, because just under a mile southeast of Silbury Hill, there's a giant tomb where the dead had been honoured since the very earliest Neolithic farmers settled in this region. Just 60 years ago, though, it had thousands of us captivated in our very own living rooms. Back in 1955, someone at the BBC had the crazy idea of televising archaeology. Duh, as if that could ever work. Uh, and they decided to do an archaeological dig in order to demonstrate what life would have been like for Neolithic people. And the site they chose is at the top of this hill. Good evening and welcome to the West Kennet Long Barrow. We've just been looking at some of the people who were working on it, and here am I standing on the edge of it. In the 1950s, Britain fell in love with archaeology. One of our party is going to walk along that ditch with a flag on a pole to show you where it is. There he goes. This relatively young science became the tonic for a nation racked by war and rationing. He's going down into it. I hope the same man appears. Oh, I trust so, yes. Buried treasure was a hit, making its presenter, Glyn Daniel, a star. It raised archaeology's popular profile, ensuring it became a subject on offer at the new universities of the 1960s. Hundreds of young people wanted to study it. In this, one of the biggest burial chambers in the country were the actual bones of 46 prehistoric Britons. And it's only in the last few years that modern statistical modelling techniques of carbon dating have thrown new light on this tomb. It had been thought that the, the, the 46 bodies people were put in just every now and again over the 1,000 years that this tomb was open. But actually, now we know the people all died within 20 to 30 years of each other and were all buried around about 3,600 BC, towards the very beginning of the Neolithic. What was the state of the bones that were found? This is the jumble of bones in one of the chambers. There's just no rhyme or reason for the way they were laid out. It's not trying to recreate a body. Even bones of one person in more than one chamber, the bodies were left out somewhere, perhaps outside the tomb. Yeah. And like um, sky burials, and they were left for animals to eat the flesh and so on. And then what was gathered up, the bones that were left were gathered up and then brought in here and placed in here. And these burials are only the start of what seems to be going on here at West Kennet. It seems to have been a place where people came back to, and they perhaps venerated the bones. Perhaps these, these were the bones of the ancestors yeah. in some way, but we've no idea who they were or why they were buried here. Then, around 2500 BC, when Silbury Hill and Avebury were being built, and after a thousand years of some sort of ritual worship here, the tomb was transformed. Yeah. Look at this huge stone. This was put in to block the tomb when it was closed at the end of the Neolithic. The original entrance was here. And these stones were all put in place to block the whole thing off, to sort of ritually close it down. So just after 2500 BC, there seems to have been a shift in the focus of ancient British beliefs. Now, prehistoric Wiltshire's society seems to have someone or some group powerful enough to decree sites like this were no longer to be used. These monuments, and the beliefs they represented, were constantly evolving. And as I head south, I'll be exploring the very latest ways to worship in the last days of the Stone Age. Now it's time to pick up the pace. This afternoon, I'm going to cross the Great Chalk Ridge that divides this landscape in two. And on the other side is the greatest Neolithic monument of them all. The first day and a half of my Wiltshire walk 
have shown me the myths and theories that surround the Neolithic monuments of Avebury. From the village of East Kennet, this afternoon I'm heading up and out of the Marlborough Downs. I'll reach Milk Hill, the highest point in Wiltshire, before passing into the Vale of Pusey, the place for exploring some of the modern mysteries that have sprung up beside so much rich Neolithic history. There's a very obvious question that springs to mind when you're looking at all these Neolithic sites in Wiltshire. Where on earth did all the stone come from? Well, it's called sarsen, it's a, a very heavy sandstone, and it's everywhere around here. Look, it's in that wall there, it's in that spire, it's in this wall here. Yep, it's on the wall of that house too. But where did it all come from? I've heard just east of here is one of the last places you can see the stones just as our ancestors would have done 6,000 years ago. These fields are absolutely littered with huge sarsen stones. Cemented together up to 60 million years ago by minerals in the groundwater, they're enormously heavy. Digging them out of the ground with only primitive tools would have been more than a nuisance. Moving them, that must have been a nightmare. And it's at least 18 miles from here to the Sarsen's most famous destination, Stonehenge. I'm finding it tough going, and I'm only carrying a backpack. If there's one person who can tell me how Neolithic people got those huge stones across these high ridges, it's my old mate Phil Harding, who knows this area like the back of his hand. Good to see you on your home territory, mate. <laughs> Welcome to Wiltshire. Thank you. Where do you reckon they took the Sarsons from here? They would have come from the Marlborough Downs yeah. and they literally would have had to get them across this landscape down to Stonehenge, away to the south, straight down there. The big problem here, of course, is getting them over this chalk ridge of the yeah. Vale of Pusey. They might have brought them through maybe one of those sort of shallow valleys down there. They might have taken them around the, the chalk on the western side, or even possibly down the, the valley of the Avon itself. It would have required a massive amount of manpower, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you are dealing with, with thousands, literally thousands of people. So it can't just have been the local people, can it? No, because people would have gravitated here. Yeah. And I regard this area as the centre of the universe. Well, you always have done, haven't you? <laughs> yes, but you see, it's many a true word spoken in jest because everything comes here. You don't need sat-nav, because you can come from Kent along the North Downs, Sussex along the South Downs, you can come up from Devon, up the Dorset Downs. All these routes funnel in. They are the ridgeways, and they're not called ridgeways because they just happen to be on the ridge. They really are ways. They're where people have been moving up and down literally for centuries, and if they've been doing it for centuries, they've probably been doing it for thousands of years as well. It is a fantastic thing. Why people came here and that strength of feeling that they had, that they had to build these monuments. It yeah. is an incredible powerful story. By 2500 BC, our ancestors had been making use of stone for thousands of years. But this time, they were building a new kind of monument, an engineering challenge that required expertise from across the country. It wasn't just more structurally sophisticated, it was more spiritually sophisticated too and it could only be built by and for a well-established civilization. Where am I going now? Well, you are going to Adam's grave. And remember, yes, you see it now, it's very heavily grassed over, it's green. But when it was constructed in the early Neolithic, it would have been gleaming white from the chalk. It would have stuck out like a pimple on a turnip. Right, well, I'll head off in that direction then. Don't get lost. <laughs> Look after yourself, mate. The fertile chalk soils of this part of Britain weren't just ideal for Neolithic farming communities, they're also the perfect place for these. 
That's one of the famous Wiltshire white horses. You always kind of hope they're going to be hundreds or even thousands of years old, don't you? Well, that one isn't. That's the Alton Barnes white horse. It was cut in the year 1812. Still, I don't really care how modern it is. It's a great marker on the landscape, isn't it? Adam's grave is a Neolithic tomb, but at the moment, I'm on the trail of more modern mysteries. For these, it's best to evoke the mood of the 1970s. It's claimed that the prehistoric sites around Wiltshire are sources of mysterious power. Apparently, Adam's grave, which is that one over there, is slap bang in the middle of the Duke's ley line. This ley line is supposedly the link between the Neolithic sites of Wiltshire, a straight line of mystical and spiritual energy that connects all these ancient sites, because our ancestors were attuned to it in some way. In fact, it's said the whole of Britain's covered in these topographical alignments. Maria Wheatley believes ley lines can be detected. She's a second-generation professional dowser. These are copper dowsing rods, and they're quite good at detecting any type of uh, energy, be that underground water or ley lines. You know I'm a little bit of a skeptic about this sort of thing. Do you think that's going to affect what will happen when I try and find the sort no, of No, because uh, I think if uh, you give it a go, the rod will detect something, whether you believe or not. Let's give it a go. All right. Do I have to hold it in any particular way? Just hold them as uh, parallel to the ground as you can yeah. and slowly walk oh, forwards. OK. Oh, that, that's swinging, but that's just the wind. That is the wind. Yeah. They, ha they have to cross fully. Yeah. <laughs> Try the other way. All right. In the same place again. I didn't do anything. I promise you, I didn't do anything. The first time down, sir, that's not bad. It felt as though the line was more like that, if that's the way it was swinging, but... Yeah, it is at quite an angle. I mean... I'm going to uh, go and follow the ley line now. I don't know if you know, but there's actually a pub on the ley line itself. So uh, I'm going to go and do a different kind of dowsing. Oh, enjoy. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. I think I might just have rediscovered my inner hippie. And so in that spirit, I'm going to continue south across this beautiful valley, following the route of the Duke's ley line. But it's not the only modern mystery around these parts. Do you remember these? This is the latest crop circle to make an appearance in the fields of Wiltshire. These strange rings of flattened crops started appearing in the 1970s. This apparently is Crop Circle Central, and I'm going to its very epicenter right down there. There have been thousands of documented cases, more here than anywhere else on Earth. As they became ever more complicated in design, crop circles even inspired their own science. Seriology. And everyone had their own theory. Well, it seems to me it's possible that it is a signature of some visitation to our planet. I think if it, if it was aliens, why aren't they speaking to us in English? If somebody tells you that they know the answer to this, forget it. But for some bizarre reason, nobody seemed to be interested in the obvious. My day's ending at the Barge Inn on the Kennet and Avon Canal, the place to stay if you want to know anything about crop circles. Who are these circle makers? Well, the circle makers are people like myself who've gone out and made circles. You have actually made crop circles? 
I might have made some in my time, yes. I had to stop, though. Why did you stop? I got arrested in 2000 and uh, fined for doing it, and um, I had a bit of hay fever as well, so it seemed like a good time to pack it in. Oh, I don't blame you. Yeah. What sort of circles did you make? One of the best ones I made was known as the basket. It had sort of over and under lay, so it looked like a basket weave. They said there's no way a human can do that. Have you heard of the basket? Oh, yes. <laughs> See, you're famous. You're legendary. So, the area doesn't really get visitors from outer space. But that doesn't stop thousands of crop circle enthusiasts from coming here. So many, in fact, it's become something of a local industry. People come from all over the world. They go to uh, Stonehenge, they go to Avebury, they, they sort of travel the area and look at some of the sacred sites, and uh, crop circles are deemed by them to be sacred sites. Who are we to tell them otherwise? <laughs> they don't believe it anyway. <laughs> they don't. They don't. Well, they they really don't. Aliens. They, they want, want it to be aliens. aliens. Yeah. Cheers to the aliens. Cheers. Thank you. To the aliens, Matt. <laughs> it just goes to show that even in the age of modern science, this area can still inspire eccentric theories. <laughs> So far on my walk, I've only managed to get glimpses of the kinds of rituals and ceremonies that these Neolithic monuments were designed for. But tomorrow, I'm going to meet some people who claim they really do have evidence of what our ancestors were up to at Stonehenge. It's the final leg of my walk through Wiltshire's famous prehistoric landscape. Today, I'm off to investigate the most debated monument of the ancient world. I'm walking to Stonehenge to see if I can work out what our Neolithic ancestors were doing there in 2500 BC. And my guide will be the magnificent River Avon. Although, frankly, this little bit isn't very mighty at all, is it? I'll be following the river, stopping off at sites that are linked with one another and the landscape that surrounds them, as I make my way to the magnificent Stonehenge. But six miles north, there's a little-known site that's very recently revolutionised our understanding of Stonehenge. Every generation has come up with its theories. I'm meeting a world-renowned archaeologist who's been at the forefront of pioneering Stone Age research for over a decade, Mike Parker Pearson. His groundbreaking theory is supported by a full gamut of cutting-edge scientific techniques. Using methods developed by nuclear physicists, Mike's discovered that the Stonehenge we see today is actually a sophisticated redevelopment of a much older, simpler stone circle. But it's here, on this site, that the story of the new Stonehenge begins. This is Darrington Walls, and it's the largest henge in Britain. Uh, I can't see anything. It's a field. <laughs> Mike's team excavated the Durrington site over several years. What we found was the remains of houses. Just one room, uh, what, five and a half metres by five and a half metres. But there were loads of these houses, making this the largest prehistoric village in Europe. At a time when the population of Britain was only in the tens of thousands, Durrington walls could support up to 5,000 people. And they first came to stay here while building the new Stonehenge. Like most building sites, Mike and his team found that masses of rubbish had been left behind. In particular, pig's teeth. By studying these teeth and subjecting them to high-tech strontium isotope analysis, Mike discovered Durrington's inhabitants didn't live here all year round, and they weren't all locals. Not people who lived here all the time. The majority are coming in from all over the country. And we're talking the west of Britain, we're talking Scotland. And they're feasting and having one of the greatest times of their lives. And this meeting and feasting 
carried on well after Stonehenge was finished. This became the great annual Neolithic festival. It's very clear that it is cyclical in terms of when the pigs are being killed, they're being culled in the midwinter. So around the time of the shortest day each year, Durrington Walls must have been quite a spectacle. And this link with deepest, darkest winter fitted with another Neolithic clue in the landscape. The central feature here was the Southern Circle. It's now underneath the road down there. It's very much a timber version of Stonehenge which Time Team reconstructed in all its glory back in the day. The entrance to this one, facing towards midwinter sunrise, actually led out onto an avenue that leads to the River Avon. So the river is very significant? I think the river is the key to the entire complex. It's what unites Darrington Walls with Stonehenge itself. So these monuments were joined to one another by a ritual procession, one that made use of the key landscape feature around them, the river. So up at Durrington, we can imagine that there was this big festival, mm. lots of drinking, feasting, it, Lord knows what, yes. and then they parade down to the river. Why were they doing this? Well, it's really, I think, the passage from life into death that the water represents the transition between Darrington Walls, the place of the living, Stonehenge, place of the dead. So it's all one huge, long belief. Yes, it's, it's basically the main rite of passage, yeah. the transition into ancestorhood after death. Instead of celebrating death at one site, like the stone circles at Avebury, and life somewhere else, like Silbury Hill, it seems this part of Wiltshire was a more spiritually sophisticated landscape, a sort of sacred one-stop shop. On their ritual journey through here, our ancestors were carrying the remains of their dead, but this time not bones, but ashes, to be buried at Stonehenge. Four miles downstream at West Amesbury, with the help of geophysics, Mike recently unearthed one of the final pieces of the Stonehenge puzzle. Here it is. <laughs> There's nothing here except grass. This is actually the site of a henge from the time of Stonehenge, a henge we didn't even know was here until a few years ago. It's a big signpost. It's also the start of the final approach to Stonehenge. This is where the avenue begins, right there on the other side of the henge, and if you follow that through the stately home... <laughs> Which someone has rather uh, unfortunately put in the way, yeah? And that will take you all the way to Stonehenge. All right, that's the way I'll go, then. Good to Cheers. see you. Cheers. I'll bet you that in the Neolithic times, there was a bloke standing <laughs> at the gateway going, that way, that way. <laughs> Back in the New Stone Age, our ancestors built this almost two-mile processional avenue, a very deliberate line of approach to Stonehenge. I'm going to try to follow it and work out why. Today, it's busy with a different kind of annual pilgrimage. People en route to Cornwall for their summer holidays. The ceremonial avenue crosses the A303 just here. It's all right, funny if I cross. Cheers. Uh, go across. Tough. Funny, isn't it, that for a lot of people, their first view of Stonehenge nowadays is in a traffic jam through the windscreen of their car. But leaving the traffic behind, you can almost feel like you're on the Neolithic journey to Stonehenge yourself. Nearly at the end of the processional avenue, you suddenly lose sight of the stones. This final dip is its builder's pièce de résistance, allowing the full drama of Stonehenge to make its impact. 
like the pilgrims, if that's the right word for them, of the Neolithic, have come all the way along the processional avenue, all the way around there, straight up here. And this is how Stonehenge was originally meant to be seen, although without that fence in the way. After three days on foot, I'm finally at the finest achievement of the new Stone Age. A powerful new monument for a new way of honoring the dead. Since the 70s, Stonehenge has always been at its busiest midsummer, when thousands of people gather to celebrate the sunrise on the longest day of the year. So it's rather ironic that archaeologists are now convinced this interpretation of the monument is completely back to front. By better understanding the direction Stonehenge is supposed to be viewed from, we now know it's not aligned for the midsummer sunrise, but for the midwinter sunset. Having walked the exact route our Neolithic ancestors took to Stonehenge, it's all making sense to me now. After setting off from Durrington Walls at sunrise on the shortest day of the year, the idea was to get here just as the light was fading, completing the ritual journey between life and death. The latest archaeological discoveries are transforming our understanding of Neolithic times. After three centuries of studying, theorising and excavating, it seems we're only now beginning to comprehend Wiltshire's ancient history. These monuments leave so much to the imagination. Maybe that's why we're so fascinated by them today. And maybe that's what makes this landscape so very special. Thank you. 